Hey guys, and welcome back to Conversations with my big sister. Um, as you guys know, my name is Linda Sifomba. Today, I have Bianca and Sbo, Spongile Info. Uh, they are here today just to have a beautiful and honest conversation with us. Stay tuned and don't go anywhere. See you guys soon. Welcome back, guys. Uh, so, Bianca, you know, I want to speak on the topic of skin, you know, and just, you know, the idea of skin, and it's for the both of you guys, just to speak around the topic of skin and, and, and the acne and the color of skin and just to dabble in terms of conversation about that. But before we get into that, I'd like for us to just take a journey in terms of your life, just to better understand who you two ladies are, you know, where you guys come from, where were you born? So I think maybe if we can just start with where do you guys come from, where were you born, and who raised you? So my name is Bianca. Um, I was born in Namibia to Kenyan parents, and I grew up here in South Africa. So my background is quite diverse. Um, it's always very difficult. It's never a, a concise answer that I can give in terms of like my background and like where I'm from. And you, know, um, it's you know when someone's like, "Where are you from?" I'm like, "Do you mean where where did I live, or where did I grow up, or where was I born, or where so my where parents are from?" I think maybe where were you yeah. born, and then where did you go? And then so <laughs> it's like it's a lot. So but um, I call South Africa home. Um, and my parents are from Kenya, as I mentioned, so we do go to Kenya quite often, and I see some of my relatives that are there. Um, and yeah, I was raised by my parents, both my parents, um, and we first started off in Namibia, obviously, and I was there until the age of two. Um, so I don't remember much about it. I haven't been back. Like, I really want to make a plan to go back. Um, from there, I then we moved to Durban, and I think we were there for about four years. And after that, we moved to Joburg. So Joburg is home. So um, yeah, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Okay. Yeah. All right. I was actually going to interject there and say, girl, you're a daughter of the soil. <laughs> you're an <laughs> African <saying>. love child. <laughs> um, I'm Swangile um, from the Eastern Cape, from the Mkilbo family. Um, Basically, my grandfather was a priest. My dad was raised in the town in a small township there near Bishaw, Zuelicha. My mom is from Fort Beaufort, and uh, I think they both met in Hill Town. Um, education was huge for the Kosas back then, so they, you know, those are, you know everybody that went to school <laughs> went to Hill Town or Alice, because that's where Forte is. And I was raised by very education, um, very educated people. People were very conscious about, you know, being educated. Because that's a very, very important thing from where I come from. And, you know, taught to respect myself, taught to respect my elders. Um, I grew up at Bisho. Um, that's where my mom and dad lived together in a house. Um, went to school in East London and King Williamstown. So all of these are in close proximity. Proximity. I didn't move around a lot, okay. so my family was always together. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Sorry. Gosh. So we have a mic today, guys. So just bear <laughs> with us, eh? Just bear. It's just gonna be moving as a wand around the. Ed, you understand? Um, okay, cool. So just take me um, through the journey of when you then got into primary school. You know, um, with you, Bianca, having to have been a person of color that is dark, mm -hmm. and did you go to a predominantly white school? Um, okay, so tell me about that. Tell me about you know being you know a woman of color there. Mm -hmm. How was your journey how did it affect you how did you um how were you emotionally you know um having to grow up in that kind of environment um so yes i did grow up in a predominantly white school um so a lot of my influences naturally come from that mm. um but i think i mean the one school i joined was called st mary's and when i was eight years old mm. And I think that's where I really started realizing some sort of difference or that, you know, we are like, we're the same, but we're not the same. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? When everyone's like, no, you're the same, but no, no you're not, really. you know? And yeah. um, I, 
what are the things that made you realize? Like, what were the instances where that that well, thought came? Yeah, there was one in particular. I was in grade two. I'll never forget it. And we all had to do, like, um, a family. We had to draw a family picture. Mm. And you do that in most schools. And I remember I was coloring in my skin. And obviously, I colored myself in brown because, yeah. I mean, I have brown skin. And I remember my best friend at the time was like, Oh, but why aren't you using the peach color? Why are you using brown? And it's crazy. We used and to like, call that color skin color. Yeah, and skin it was color. Like <laughs> um, and I was just like, um, I, I was like, I don't know. I literally said, I don't. I was like, because this this is my skin. And she was like, and then she was like, no, you're supposed to use skin color. And I was like, I was so. I mean. And she was adamant, you know, like, like, but why, you know, so it was very, very confusing. And that only really made sense to me, like, much later. Mm. I think at the time I was just like, what? And then I just continued, like, coloring myself in. So that was the one, like, major one Mm. um, from when I joined the school. That was the first instant where I was like, whoa, okay, this is strange. Okay, maybe we're not all the same type of thing. Because I'm, like, in the same breath when when I say... um, you know, we, we aren't all the same, even though we are. I still, I'm not a person really that sees color, to be honest. I'm not, I don't judge someone first on the color of their skin. I don't do that. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, when all these small things started happening, it was kind of like, whoa, you know. Or, for example, um, we'd all go to someone's house, and it's like a white girl's house, and everyone is white except mm. me. Mm. And we all swimming, and then it's kind of like... Um, I'm the only one putting cream on at the end. And everyone's like, Because <laughs> you're going to get ashy. <laughs> it's like, why are you putting it? And I'm like, yeah. I like, this is what my mom said, that like when I'm done swimming, I, I need, need to, to put, put cream, cream on, you know? And, sure. and I remember like, it happened so many times where they would ask me like, why am I doing this thing? And it, then I just like stopped doing it. And there, there's little old me like burnt from the sun. <laughs> I'm like, as she, like, I remember my mom fetched me from my friend's house the one day and she was like, never again. Like, we had this whole, like, it was really bad. She reprimanded me. She's like, never again. Make sure, <laughs> she, you know, make sure you cream yourself and you look after. Her. I'm like, no, Hectic. but all my other friends aren't doing that. So, like, and they're fine, you know. So, it was a lot of very confusing things. Yeah, yeah. You know, as a, as a seven or eight year old, mm. it's like, I it don't doesn't understand. make sense. Yeah. You know, so, um, it was just a lot of a lot of that um, in in primary school, and then um, senior primary um, still the same, mm. just on a high level. Um, like for example, we all getting ready to go to a social, and um, like we all putting makeup on, but it's like makeup for black people versus makeup yeah, for white people now. Different. Yeah, and now I'm sitting here with like thick silver eyeshadow, looking like a clown, like I look crazy, you know, but like. I don't see that it's it's weird, yeah. you know, um, because I remember my friend at the time was like, come, like, I want to do your makeup, and I was like, cool, sure, and like, yeah. I thought I looked good, I looked in the mirror, but like, it was pretty obvious, like, girl, <laughs> girl, like, <laughs> no, color it's not working, no. <laughs> <laughs> foundation is so light, like, it was so bad, but I didn't see it because I didn't understand, <laughs> so it was a lot of like, just oh, not understanding best. or, you know, not having someone to look up to, to be like, oh, that's how mm. you do it. Or, mm. you know, that's very, so very good. confusing. Um, and then when I went into high school, it was, so now a lot more um, black girls joined the school. So I was like, this is, this is nice. Mm. Like, mm. okay, cool. You know, so there was more of us and it felt a bit better. But mm. in the same breath, um, I still felt excluded in many ways because mm. now it wasn't so much a thing of skin, skin color it was a thing of okay you grew up in south africa but you're not south african mm. you know mm. um mm. so so in high school that was the main thing it yeah. wasn't so much about oh i'm black or i've got dark skin it was kind of like okay but you're trying to be white because of how you speak mm. but you know um but you're black but mm. so it was very very weird mm. um to be honest i never ever felt like I fit in anywhere. Mm, um, it was kind of like I was accepted more by the people w- by white, white people, people. Yeah, you know, because I was like, oh, cool, like more black people. This is so awesome. And yeah. then I try and be a part of it, and it's kind of like, oh no, girl, it's like, closed off yeah, to you. very much so. And it was kind of like, oh, sorry, you don't understand Zuni, you don't understand, so, so sorry, you can't sit with that type mm. of thing, you know. So that was also confusing. But now, um, 
you know, I'll be sitting with white people. And it's like, but why are you sitting with the white people? It's mm. like, because when you I try and come and peace. sit with you guys, it's a problem. So it was tough. I won't lie. It was very, very tough. Um, very confusing. Very, especially, I remember I was in grade nine when the xenophobia attack started. And it was, it was scary, mm. you know. Mm. Um, I didn't have anyone that could relate mm. at all. I was like, shucks. Like, if our school is attacked next, like, what's going to happen to me? Yeah. I, I'm the only one who's not from here. Yeah. And everyone else who isn't from here is white, you know, like there were some French girls who weren't from South Africa, but they were white. So. And also growing up here, like, I feel like you've grown up in South Africa for such a long time. For yeah. you in that moment, you, you felt like your home was yeah. no longer your home. Like exactly. your emotions felt exactly. that way So well. it was, I was just always confused, mm. you know, I, I didn't know where, where I belonged. Like, it was just like, I felt like I was floating all the time, oh, like... I didn't really have that, you know, ground to be like, you know what I mean? This is where, I, where I'm from. And it was very difficult mm. to even be able to claim like, oh, no, but I'm from here. Like, yeah. I grew up here, so I feel like I'm from here. But then it's like, oh, but you can't do this and you don't speak this and you don't, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was very, very difficult. Um, but, yeah, that was that was pretty much primary all the way through to high school for me. Yeah. So after the break, I'd love to just find out from Spongile as well, just your journey um, through primary, through high school and with your skin tone. And, you know, where did you go in terms of schooling and how did that environment, you know, if you can just explain in those moments and in those instances, how did that make you feel, you know, in hi not in hindsight, but, you know, w when you were, you know, during in those, you know, moments, you know, you were experiencing that. So see you guys in a couple of seconds. So welcome back, guys, to Conversations with My Big Sister. I am here with Bianca and Uspongile. So we're going to shoot straight to Uspongile just to take us through your primary school years, high school, just your schooling as when you were younger. Um, so you asked Bianca about, you know, when she realized she was different, you know, in going to Model C schools and being integrated with white people. Um, I think for, for me and my family, I think I was always conscious, you know, like I feel like my father, you know, he used to make us dance to songs, Zum Zabalaz, or it was fun for him and it, you know, there were no white people <laughs> in our neighborhood if you should, it's majority black people. The first crash I went to was black people. My first language is Xhosa. I never spoke a word of English for like a couple of years. I literally had to learn English over time and it was a, it was a difficult thing for me. But I remember being so conscious of my blackness and just being so afraid of white people. And I don't know where that fear stemmed from, but I was like, because they just looked scary. <laughs> I don't know. Mm. <laughs> they did because they were so different. Yeah. And they had different hair. And yeah. yeah. And I don't know if it was the way that apartheid had affected our parents and their mindset. I, there was almost a sense of, you know, inferiority when it came to white people. And they seemed so snooty and up there. I mean, mm. when you switched on TV, you know, you saw, like, Bold and the Beautiful, Days of Our Lives, and they were the picture of success mm. in the world yeah. up there. And it was really scary yeah. <laughs> and daunting because it's like, first of all, I can't even speak that language. Mm. And I remember the first time they told me that I'm going to go to a white school. They're going to send me to a and when white crash. And when was, was this in? Oh, a crash. A crash. Okay. So mm. I had to go from a black crash to a white crash. That, wow. was, that was a bit tough for me because I still did not know English probably up until the age of four. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's all I knew, black people. And I remember saying, and they always remind me, and they always laugh about it, about how I used to cry and say, <laughs> meaning, I don't want to go to the white people. I don't want to go work with them. I don't want to go to school with them. I just don't want to be around them. I was genuinely afraid. Yeah. I was genuinely scared because I just didn't know what to expect. And, you know, I didn't know the Rainbow Nation as we know it. You know, re my reality was black people yeah. mm. and at home we grew up as light-skinned people so i never saw my light skinnedness because my mother's half colored um her dad is colored and 
her mother is just super light skinned. So I always hear that we're mixed. But for me, that was, I was like, okay, I don't know anything about that. My mom's black, my dad's black. So I guess that makes me black. Yeah. So I never, I could never think about being mixed. I could never think about being, you know, different mm-hmm. from the people that were around me mm-hmm. because we all spoke the same language. Mm-hmm. We had the same gross hair. Mm-hmm. Like my hair gave me trouble. Like it, I was, in essence, seriously black. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was for me. It was a, it was a difficult integration because when I saw white people, when I was amongst white people, culturally they were so different yeah. to me. Yeah. You know how they ate was so different to me. You know, at home we taught to eat with our mouths closed, and white people I always so used to see white kids just chewing like it's this. So true. Oh my god. And I'm like. If I was at home, somebody would like yeah. smack me. Yeah. Like yeah. I'm being weird. So it was a culture shock, mm-hmm. and f- and for a while I think I was separated, yeah. and I and I felt like I just couldn't, I couldn't integrate for a while. So separated from what you know. S- separated from what I know, and separated also in the school environment. Like I could not, I could not relate. I could not play with other white kids and. Mm. So I, 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 I think, as Bianca was mentioning, how other black kids, um, when they came, you know, they when yeah. exactly they, mm. they, were they always um, gravitated to each other. But I think because we had, you know, commonality, we understood each other. It's like we understood, we had a common understanding of who we are, where we come from, um, mm. what our parents have been through. And it's almost like also the white kids had that understanding with themselves that we culturally we understand each other. Mm. And subconsciously, it wasn't even, I don't think it was like a conscious <coughs> thing that you guys gravitated towards each other. Because, I mean, at that age, you weren't conscious enough mm. to know that, okay, you're black, <coughs> I'm going to be with you, you're white, yeah. I'm going to, I think subconsciously, because of what you've said, you felt yourselves drawn to each other yeah. in a very subconscious, in that time period of your life. Yeah, for sure. And and because I was very scared of white people, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while. Like this carried on literally up until grade one, and of course I went to a white school. Um, I moved with my father to Stutterheim. He was uh, teaching at a secondary s- high school in the township there, and I went to the school in town. And that's where I went to grade one, and still very, I was very very poor in English. Mm. <laughs> to this day, I have no idea how I passed grade one because. Mm. I remember understanding Dololo. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I was wrong. <laughs> it was it, it was it was a very interesting time because for the first time it was like now I'm starting to play with white kids more and I kind of looked at them with envy because I was starting to notice things about them that I didn't mm. have. What was that? Like their hair, mm. I think that Sorry is to for me too, girl. that's like Sorry. the num. I think that was almost yeah. the number one envy of every little black child. Yeah. I mean, we used to play with their oh. hair exactly. <laughs> there we are, Brady. So oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> and Nicole, Nicole, can I sit behind yeah. you so that I can like play with your hair? Yeah, sure, Lynn. <laughs> And it was so such true. a privilege when they would ask you to scratch their back yeah. and play with their hair because we would oh my gosh so true, this guys. is playtime this true. is my oh dream God. like i swear i used to pray to god and you know for long white mm-hmm. hair and that's, that's so all true. i wanted and for i think a while for many years mm-hmm. i just could not identify with my blackness anymore i felt like it was stripped for me that is so deep. gradually um because I couldn't speak English and because I was really awful at it, they, you know, at school they would encourage us to speak English at home. So slowly my, my um, African language, my home language mm. was being taken away right out of you. the home. It was being taken away from me. And you find now, like years later, it's impacted my whole life. I mean, we'll be at home and we both closer speaking English. Mm. We can speak our like native mm. language, but we speak English. We think in English. When you think about praying, you want to pray in English. Mm. You know, w- English is what you know. The way, the white way of life is what you've become so accustomed to, and mm. it's become our norm, and what you are most comfortable, you know, mm. doing mm. and you know speaking and being. Mm. Sure. So, I think that's when I started asking God some deep questions because I was like, 
I don't understand then why I'm black mm. if our lives are so much harder. Mm. Mm. Because we could always see that the white people's lunches is like m- way more delicious. Mm. I mean, for us, we probably get two slices of <laughs> brown bread, butter, and peanut butter. And we get like a sigzo with, and when you close your bottle, you put a plastic first and then you oh, close it yes. so that it doesn't leak. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, like, my lunch looked like poverty. And <laughs> white people had snacks and fun things in their lunch boxes. And oh I was my like, gosh, they had like that cheese thing. Uh, what was Melrose. Melrose. Oh stuff. my gosh. And Mom, remember milk, Melrose? Like, That's oh, all like I remember. Fruit, like, white they? people in adverts Chocolate were having milk. so much fun. Yeah, they really <laughs> were. <laughs> First you twist it, then you dunk. I mean, yeah, like, you lick it, the then, then you dunk it. it. I was like, yo, I have to be white. That's my goal <laughs> in life. Do, all we do is dunk bread and like water, sugar water. Tea. <laughs> yo, sugar water is such a treat. Sugar star shot. It's the way to go. <laughs> so, I mean, growing oh. up, those are the things that we were confronted with. Mm. I remember a time in, in, in a primary school. Mm. So I went to a girls' school from grade two on. Um, in East London, and uh, I remember, you know, we were struggling <coughs> at home, and you know, mom didn't have a lot of money, and dad was not very, <laughs> very supportive, and they had separated at the time, and uh, you know, we'd go some, we'd go through some really tough times, mm. you know, financially, and you know, there were times when mom would tell me that, dude, I used to, pay, I used to go home after deductions with seventy nine rand. Mm imagine that even in the 90s that was nothing mm. that was nothing in the 20s like that's how bad it was you know our like s- some of our parents were drowning yeah. in debt you yeah. know that's what's real for my parents generation yeah. they that's knew how to have credit cards and mm-hmm. the deductions were m- with more than they were earning and the struggle was real i mean we even lost our car at some point and you know i remember even my school shoes they you know Zia's a pillar on my feet. They would literally, I'd have mm-hmm. holes mm-hmm. in my school shoes because my mom couldn't afford to buy us new school shoes. So there was this inferior, infer- that inferiority complex was just increasing. And the gap and the divide between where I felt like or where I saw myself, you know, being poor and, you know, and privilege of the white people. It, it, that gap seemed to widen over the years and I mean there were so many of us black girls with relaxed hair because you know at, at school <laughs> now they were making straight. ridiculous rules about how you're not allowed to have an mm-hmm. afro your hair must be neat because they only understood what white hair must mm-hmm. do yeah. not what black hair yeah. can do and yeah. what it looks like yeah. and so for us it was like dude we gotta have straight hair yeah. Yeah. and by the way when your hair is relaxed it's way more manageable yeah. But, I mean, we couldn't relax our hair every month, nor could we do treatments, because those treatments were so expensive, expensive for our parents. Yeah. And so you'd always have this black girl with bushy hair, half relaxed, mm. half mm. curled. floating on the ends. <laughs> you know that glisten in the sun, right. like that kind of grease where if you lean back on something, <laughs> you leave your mark. <laughs> it's late. It's late for the color of your shirt. It's just so late. <laughs> It was really, <laughs> those, those, those oh were the tough times. And I mean, your hair would be orange, sun bleached, babes, on the edges, just like the true s- symbol of poverty. Like, mm. you mm. And you have cracked lips just to complete the picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, mm. I mean, you'd always look at white people and think, whoa, I'm so black. <laughs> like, mm. I am not a part of these people. Mm. Again, that reality of the white people sticking together, they always did mm. because firstly, they could also afford, they were hanging out at their extra meals that their parents could mm. afford to pay for. Um, they had common interests, you know, they mixed with the boys from the boys' school. Mm. You know, it was just the, the areas they grew up, t- uh, you know, they grew up in and the people they hang around and the, p- the things that their parents integrate them in that kind of separated us further. Mm. All the white kids would play hockey, swimming, and maybe cross country, Mm. and and all the affluent sports. Mm. And all the black kids were like, well, at least we can afford a skirt. Let's go play netball, the ball's free. So, (laughs) again, we were so divided. I mean, coming to 
being conscious about my skin tone, it became it became like a topic amongst the black kids. You know, as much as you know, at home, I was literally I thought I was the darkest. You know, at school it was like, dude, you are so light. Like I st- I'm still getting used to people commenting about my skin tone, because for me it was like, dude, if I could just be brown, mm. I would love. <laughs> To be brown because I was just like, I identify so much with these people. If I can just entrench my blackness <laughs> even more mm-hmm. and, you know, and that be my true identity. I want to be a part of that. You know, I want that. And so I remember sun tanning. Like I decided that I was going to sun tan. I did the same <coughs> thing, but I burnt. That's <laughs> what happened to me. I, in the 2004. Day <laughs> as well. 2004, we... we it was like around New Year's time, and you know everybody goes to the beach, and you know you grab a spot, and you're there the whole day, and you have fun. And I was like, "This is the day I am going to turn brown. I am going to be truly black," because in school people were always were like, "You know what? You are just too light. Like get away." Mm. So it was it was almost the same mm. experience as mm. Bianca, just being a light skinned girl, mm. you know, in an environment where all the black girls wanted to stick together. I was like. You're a bit too different. Mm. We're just not sure. You may, why are you so light? Yeah. And like, why is it a problem? Exactly. <laughs> why is it a problem that I'm light skinned? Mm-hmm. And so I. F- no, you, sorry. Oh. So <laughs> if Clive does that, just like, I'll I'll notice it and then I'll I'll still be the Clive. I was also like, <laughs> <laughs> Gee, what's happening? So like, don't pay attention <laughs> to him. Like, just I'll I'll. Okay. Yeah. okay, cool. So, so the next so time it's he does for this, you. it's for me. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So <laughs> I, I decided this is the day I was going to be brown. I got so badly sunburned. Mm. I don't even know at which point in the day or how long I was in the sun for. Mm, mm, mm. It wasn't even just that little burn where your nose peels no, and you okay. have like a little red patch. Things or were bad. Things were bad. <laughs> I could not cover myself with blankets. Shucks. I, no one could touch me wearing <laughs> clothes with torture. Yo, like the yo. skin was swollen. Mm. I was like wow. thoroughly yeah. red. I was like yeah, somebody cool. boiled me. I was so raw. And that's when I realized that I was actually a little bit white. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, perhaps you are Mlungu. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> People uh, sun kissed don't burn like this. Yeah. They do not suffer <laughs> yeah. like you just did. I remember my mom had to go to the chemist and like get mm. medicines for my skin and it took me a while. I was peeling the whole of summer. It was awful. Oh I was like gosh. gray. I didn't even go brown. I went gray. <laughs> that was so traumatic. Mm. Wow. And then I was like, okay, fine. I'll accept myself. So we w- at the time we were living in a, pl- in a place in East London called Quigney and there there was a lot of colored people. So I was like, maybe I'm colored. Mm. <laughs> maybe I'm colored. And so I... I slowly started like rejecting my blackness. Mm. Um, I'm so sorry, guys. Um, because we have a mic, I can't just ingest. Now I have to like do a young hand gesture, <laughs> which is so uncomfortable. But anyway, see you guys in a couple of seconds. I'd love for you to delve deeper into that, into you having to identify with the colored and having to feel like that's actually who you are. So see you guys soon. Bye. Welcome back to Conversation. So Spongile, you were just about to do- delve into having to identify with the colored and you know how that affected you. So, I mean, these people had the same skin tone as me. Yeah. Not exactly the same hair, but I was like, okay, maybe I'll try fit in right here. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> this, this is where I can start. Maybe like, you know, I can find my group of folks. And I mean, at that time, I think I was starting to actually really learn about my mom's true background and who her father was and she didn't quite have a, a relationship with her dad mm-hmm. he was kind of like just a baby daddy um <laughs> but even you know my mom had the same experience growing up you know she was super white in the <laughs> rural areas yeah. um i mean she came like her, my mom's mom was pretty light and you know they come from some kind of Asian background oh mixed with black. Wow. I don't know how true Girl. any of this is. My mom cannot give me straight facts, <laughs> 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 but I know there's something going Your on genes there. Are like 
to the top. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. That's why yeah. I have Bruce Lee legs. Um <laughs> Oh yes, you have amazing legs. <laughs> like, by the way. It's from my Chinese uh, ancestors, just so you know. Mm, 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 if it's true. Um Yeah. And you know, they were just so fun and they were so welcoming and you know just the community in itself was very, very integrated. It was mostly poor whites, mm. you know, coloreds, blacks, and just apartments. So everybody was like, sort of like equal. And um, I remember like my first fake boyfriend was colored, you mm. know, Sergio. I re- he lived in the apartment block, like a s- this across the street, yeah. like a few houses away. And you know, I remember I wrote him a letter, but it was supposed to be anonymous. And um, somebody, the guy, the little boy who delivered the letter, kind of like told him the whole story about who di- who wrote you the letter. Oh it was gosh. like a day. And then next thing, Sergio writes me a letter back with pictures and everything, asking me out. I was like, hell no, I'm not ready. I'm too young. <laughs> <laughs> I never How responded. How old were you at this point? I must have been like 11 or 12. <clears throat> about 11, I think. But because it was a day and because I was like... I don't think Sergio would like me because I'm black. Mm. Because I still so had crazy. that thing. Yeah, yeah. That's true. That's so true. I was like super scared because I was like, I think Sergio's in high school and I'm not sure what I've gotten myself into. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so, and so like, I started to slowly see myself a bit different. And because now like these people kind of like have accepted me, you know. Do you think because of that <coughs> you were starting to to accept yourself more? Do you think you know the rejection of you know our black people back mm. you know where you left them back home and you coming into this new environment where people look more like you did you think that then gave you a feeling of you know con- more confidence and more security within yourself because I don't you could see yourself through them not really mm. and i think that that would be far from it because i couldn't identify with my true self mm. Even at that point, I was like, I gotta have straighter hair. Because mm-hmm. I don't mean I don't have the good hair. I'm not colored enough. I'm still not good enough. I'm still not there. Mm-hmm. My nose is not sharp enough. You know, my face, my body, my structure is not mm-hmm. Caucasian enough. It's mm-hmm. not colored enough. So there was never a space where I was good enough to fit in mm-hmm. these other communities. Whereas I could just accept that I'm a black girl. I'm meant to be curvy. I'm meant to have curly, kinky hair. My nose is fine the way it is. It should be around because you're black. You, you have a spongo, you know, a forehead. Embrace it. You're beautiful the way you are. So I, I felt like I need to try harder mm. to be different, to fit in. Mm. And uh, mm. I mean, for the next couple of years, <coughs> I put my hair through hell. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember there was a trend where black girls now, after going to the salon, you didn't have to have that like bone straight hair that kind of sticks out. Because, you know, like that relaxed hair that doesn't move. Mm. Yes. And it's, you know. With the styling gel. It, it just dark and lovely. <laughs> Oil moisturizer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's, you know, not too long. It's like a cat licked your. Yeah. Your hair and the <laughs> hair just stayed like that. Mm. Ooh, fresh hair. <laughs> now they were like blow drying the hair and had movement yeah, and it had girl. body oh, and yeah. oh my god, we were like we felt like we've made it. <laughs> we're part of the world. Our hair is nice mm. also, but maybe it won't grow to our shoulders. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe it won't even grow exactly. to a back length. Yeah. But it's okay. It moves now. Now we're like we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah, we're getting progress. closer. Mm. We, there's progress. We're getting closer to the goal. We're getting whiter. We're becoming more colored. It's great. Um, I think in the end, I think it taught us to segregate ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to be to discriminate our blackness. I think, as 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 great as it was to be integrated into these white schools and and to go to school with everybody, and we were so privileged. We can't take away from the fact that we were privileged to get that education and to be a part of um, what South Africa, you know, was becoming as a rainbow nation, as an integrated nation. Mm -hmm. Um, But it really did strip our identity as black people away, our consciousness. And um, I feel like even 
after all these years, it, it's something that we're still working on. And even with the rise of black consciousness in the most recent years, you know, for me, I think the greatest break breakthrough in the past couple of years was when the ethnic or natural hair um, movement started. And I think that really got the ball started and the ball rolling on black people identifying themselves as black and being proud mm. and being okay with being different and really embracing that and 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 thinking and looking at that as our honor as our crown as as our differentiator as what makes us special as a people as a nation and i think it's really united us all in the greater scheme like not just South Africans, mm. I think people from beyond mm, the borders, yeah. you know, of you know, South Africa and the greater Africa. So before we get to that part of your consciousness of being aware of your blackness yeah. and actually embracing it, I'd like for us to just continue the journey first before getting to your um, where you've now, you know, identified yourself and now you know your identity and you know who you are, you know, as an as a person. And I mean, coming to you, Bianca, then you moved into, um, you know, high school and then getting into university. Did anything change, you know, in terms of your skin? Um, we could speak about the condition of your skin. Mm -hmm. Did you then, you know, you know, things of acne and as well mm -hmm. with your color? Did you feel um, the acceptance, the you know, rejection? Um, can you take us, you know, through that journey, you know, your personal journey then? So no, okay. I still didn't feel the acceptance, mm -hmm. um, and I think just as a teenager, like it's still confusing, you know. So I I matriculated and. I was literally, I didn't know what I wanted to study, yeah. you know. I wasn't that, I wasn't that student that knew, cool, I want to be a doctor and yeah. I'm going, like. People are so blessed to know. Gosh, I was like, like, I wish, like, I used to pray so much for that. <laughs> and it wasn't like that for me. So yeah. there was also that stress now of, like, all my friends are going to UCT and going to, you know, uh, VIT and going overseas. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm not too sure, like, uh, what I want to study, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, my main passion at the time was netball. And I mean, I was playing for a very long time. I was playing provincially and I got a uh, scholarship. So I ended up s using my scholarship and studying at UJ. But it was very, it was so general. Um, Cause still, I didn't know what I wanted to study. So I did a general BA and it was miserable. Like oh, it was the worst year ever. I won't lie to you because again, now I'm dealing with um, not fitting in because of my skin color and because I'm black and all of these different things, but now um, I was also dealing with not fitting in because I didn't know what I wanted in life. Sure. You know, it's so important to know like what you want and what direction you're trying to go in. Mm. Otherwise you sort of still, like I said earlier, floating, you know, so I still felt like, oh my gosh, like when am I gonna find that thing that's gonna make me feel like, okay, like mm. here, this is me, here I am, you know? Um, so, yeah, I still dealt a lot with just feeling, I think all the years from primary into high school really, really destroyed me because I was never able to look at myself in the mirror and feel like, wow, you know, you're beautiful yeah, or yeah. you're worth something. Like, honestly, my self-esteem was in the ground. Like, I was so low, you know what I mean? But I would sort of mask all of that with a smile and with cracking jokes. And what and do you think contributed to that, to feeling that way? Um, I think a lot of it was just feeling like an outcast all the time. And I don't think, I mean, this is like a topic for another day. It isn't only like my skin color. It's just how I am in general. Mm. And I'm you not can delve into it. It yeah, is still um, a topic of today. Okay, well. okay, cool. Well, I'm <laughs> not like someone who really, I don't go follow the norm. Like, I'm really, I'm just like, I'm different. Like, many people might call me weird, but I just don't. I don't like I don't feel like I'm a follower you know and um, I think some people like don't relate to that you know what I mean mm -hmm. like i sometimes even now I feel like I don't really relate to people my age at all because I'm not always really doing what most people my age do mm -hmm. um, so you know I'm not someone that like forces things as well if a conversa conversation feels difficult or you know, it's like not flowing. I'm sort of like, oh, okay, and I leave it. You know, I don't really, I don't force things. Um, 
but anyways, I mean, I the whole the whole skin color thing coming back to that. Um, it was just like all the years of like just I, I felt ugly to be honest. Mm-hmm. Like I felt like my skin color was wrong. Mm-hmm. I felt like being black was wrong. I felt like being dark was wrong. I didn't know how to um, take care of my skin as well. Like I stopped moisturizing, as I said. Like, and we need to moisturize, you know. Um, I I was doing all sorts of things, bleaching my skin, also in the sun as well, because I was like, okay, everyone's tanning. Like, let me tan, but it's not really working for me yeah. because I'm dark. You know, it was just very, very confusing. I think just all the years of that got me to this point where I just felt really broken, yeah. and. Um, there was a time, I don't know if you guys remember, but on Facebook, there's this thing called Honesty Box. It was years ago. Mm-hmm. And basically how it works is someone could write in your Honesty Box, and it was all anonymous. So they could say whatever they wanted to say about you, and it would come up pink if it was from a girl and blue if it was from a guy. Mm-hmm. And um, that really traumatized me. That sure. was in like grade nine, I think. And same time as the xenophobia attacks, yeah. I was just getting a lot of hate, and it was only from guys. So um, sure. that messed up with my self-confidence yeah. as well, you know, because I felt like, shucks, okay. In order for me to be, like, attractive like, enough, I need okay, to Okay, I don't know, that. yeah, I don't know, what, like, what to be. Like, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, no, you're so dark, or go back to Kenya, or yeah. all sorts of things, you know. So that really, really damaged me because I felt, again, like I didn't fit in. I felt ugly. Mm. I felt like, okay, how do I become lighter? Mm. But even still... I still won't really fit in because I don't really feel like I belong in the yeah. country, but I grew up here. It was just very, very confusing. Mm-hmm. And um, anyways, to sum, it, sum all of that up, um, I it was very random, but I decided to join a modeling agency. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where like everything changed. Like when I, w- when I joined, I was still very, very low, very insecure, just like, what am, I, what am I even doing? Yeah. Like, what am I trying here? You know, and a lot of people didn't really, they weren't supportive. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, oh, but you think you, I'm like, no, guys, I don't think yeah. I'm like amazing and beautiful. I'm really just trying to do something because I don't know. Let me just see where this takes me. I was always too afraid to try things because I always felt like I'd be judged or like people were shutting you, you down. You know, it just, it was difficult. Yeah. And, um, Ever since, like, after, like, booking a few jobs and stuff, I started getting complimented on my skin. And I was kind of like, I don't know how to take it. I'd be like, oh, oh thanks. So and true. kind of like, you know, yeah. and just move on. Like, I never knew how to embrace the compliment because I didn't see it as that. Like, time as well. Yeah, it's you like, what? That this like, the skin this was, was ugly. Like wrong, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like, um, that started happening a lot. And I think that's when the change happened. Mm. Um... And I sort of, I was like, okay. And I started reflecting. And I was like, okay, cool. So may- maybe you're not so bad. Like maybe, you know. And slowly it started happening where my self-confidence came. And I just grew as um, a person, as a woman, as a black being. Mm-hmm. You know, I started uh, coming into my own. Um, but it took a long time. Like mm-hmm. that was 2011 when these things started happening. Mm-hmm. And I think I only really came into my own like, maybe two years ago like properly Mm. and still now I'm still like yeah I have my moments you know but I remember like just my journey and what I've been through and Mm. stuff you know but yeah I mean I think right now it doesn't bother me Mm. at all um it's just like when I like like now when I have to talk about I'm like shucks like I went through that Mm. you know Mm. I went through years of looking in the mirror and like crying because I feel like I can't relate to this person that I see I don't know how to carry myself. I don't know how to act, like, you know. And I I was always described as a shy person, Mm. but I don't think I was shy. I think I was just extremely insecure. Mm. And I was always too scared to speak up or to say my opinion because it was kind of like, Mm. it it just, it felt like it would be wrong because of my skin color. I don't know how that happened in my head. I don't know how that, like, it's it's weird like to explain but I think I really do think that's what happened it just took everything down like it took my voice away mm. completely mm. you know I didn't have a backbone I was always like following all the time mm. you know and um but I do think it was necessary for me to go through that because now I'm the complete opposite mm. 
now I'm like, no, I don't feel like going out and yeah, deal, deal with, with it, it you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like before yeah. I'd be like, oh no, so-and-so is going to be so upset yeah. that I don't want to, you know what I mean? But now I'm kind of like, no guys, like it's, it goes deeper. Like it goes so deep because it's like, I finally realized that like, I also have a voice, also have an opinion. I can also say if I don't like something, mm -hmm. you know, I really got to a point where I was just like, oh, I let me just try please that. these people so I can fit in or please this person so they may think I'm like less dark mm -hmm. or, you know, it was, it was really quite messed up if mm -hmm. I think about it now. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. that's, I think, I think that's me in a nutshell. Yeah. yeah. I get that and it's like those kinds of thoughts are thoughts that you have but like you don't really address them like you don't actually really like recognize them as issues or, or things they're things that you think about and then they get trapped in your subconscious and exactly. they don't come to your conscious and you, you don't even start to have conscious conversations about those kinds of you know they're very traumatic yeah. if you actually think about it it's about so it. like psychological and so in-depth and it really alters your identity and who you are as a person um I'll see you guys in a couple of seconds. Uh, stay tuned. Welcome back to Conversations with My Big Sister. I think the one topic that I really, really, you know, want to talk about is acne um, and dealing with acne. And, you know, while we were away on break, you wanted to say something that was very, very important about that. But before you, you speak about that quote, I'd like for you to speak about your journey with acne and how it affected you. And when did it start for you? Um, so I just want to start about, you know, like, um, by speaking about uh, my family, okay. right? So f I think for me and my family, acne is hereditary. Mm. Um, my father always had like skin pro um, problems with his skin on his back. Mm. Um, most of my aunts have had like, you know, serious acne scarring. Mm. So for me, that just tells a history of like really bad, um, of a really bad acne history. Mm on my father's side of the family. My mom had beautiful skin as a young woman. Um, and I've always had uh, problems with the skin on my back. Mm -hmm. So even from when I was still a young girl, I would always have like a fungal infection on my back or something was weird with my skin on my back. Mm -hmm. And that really did take a shot at my confidence. Yeah. So I, I just grew up knowing that, no, I don't want to show my back. Yeah. I can't wear a tank top. And it's, mm. it's still a thing that yeah. really like, hits me up until this day because it's like in my mind I'm like this is so gross it's like I can't stand my own skin mm. and I feel like I have to apologize mm. for it before somebody sees it how it's like how crazy is that hey it's like yeah. and it, it's the weirdest thing and I it's relate to that and I always yeah. used to like worry about even like falling in love and yeah. getting intimate and all of that I was yeah. like oh my gosh what if he's grossed acne. out yeah. and he like yeah. hates my skin <laughs> what am I gonna do so I, I was that. like okay you know what some people have bigger problems mm. i never mm. or i never had acne on my face mm. like throughout high school like i always thought maybe that would never be my problem mm. so i was like okay maybe like my it's just my back i can cover that yeah. like i would look at the skin on my body i'm like you have nice skin but on the rest of your body <laughs> but your back why are, you not <laughs> to what's happening why to are we not playing back? the same <laughs> game <laughs> I was like, this back <laughs> is holding me is back. holding me back in life. And I was like, yo, I can always wear a t-shirt. Cool. That's fine. In high school, like in primary school, like um phys ed was part of the education. And so mm. I was always in great shape. You know, you aside, do have a great body. Aside like from the fact is. that I used to starve half the time because mm, really? that's like, another topic. You only have two breaks and you have little lunch, which you probably finish at first break because you're so hungry mm. by first break. And then second break, you're like, oh man. Yeah, second oh break. Man. Man. <laughs> I'm like, why do they even have second <laughs> break? Why can't it just be one break and then, you know? Second break was to torture all the black kids because really you didn't was. have money for tuck shop. I honestly feel like that's what it was. I agree with you. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> so I always thought, so like in high school, I kind of lost it. Like, oh, if you're um, broke in general, even if you're yeah. a white person that's broke, it's there to torture you. Yeah. <laughs> Because you don't have any money. Tuck shop was a sin for kids because <laughs> you don't earn anything. Like, you have no exactly. money. <laughs> the devil. <laughs> you ask for five rand. Mom. What are you going to do with five rand? It's a lot of money. <laughs> five rand goes a long like, way. It goes a long, a long way. way. Oh. Like, it got so bad that 
I used to chow my best money for and eat that donut. Like I would go <laughs> buy that donut and then I would make my sister and I walk home. We used to oh, like we did the dodgiest things, like oh, we were man. so bad just to have some nice things. But anyhow, in high so I mean we had phys ed and after school we had sports mm. and aftercare and all of that. And because we were also like children, we played a lot. Mm. High school, oh my gosh, I gained so much weight, like in grade eight. Mm. And I went to a new school. It was mostly black kids mm. and um black kids didn't do a lot of sports. Mm. <laughs> they didn't swim, mm. didn't really play hockey. And the sports I was really interested in, I was like really can't afford mm. to go play cricket i was like it was a new thing for me i was like oh i'd love to play mm. cricket i'd love wow, to they had women's like girl cricket yes we had a Jeez, girl cricket that team so advanced. that didn't last long oh. i don't remember uh. there being a cricket <laughs> team <laughs> by the time i matriculated yeah but i remember like you know because we were a majority black um school at that point all the students were pro- were mostly black and all the teachers were mostly white and there were a few white girls here and there <coughs> By um, matric time, <coughs> you know, we try to find girls for the gala team. Because mm. now gala must still happen. doesn't matter if you're mm. black. What's gala? Swimming gala. Yeah, oh, swimming gala. okay. Swimming gala. So at, in my house, we, I was in the Hunt House, the Blue House. We, we didn't have enough white girls to swim. So we had to volunteer. <laughs> and mm-hmm. we hadn't done sports in years. Oh, <laughs> we were so man. out of shape. So like in those years, I gained a lot of weight. And I lost even more self-confidence i got so big Mm. bigger than i ever thought i'd be Mm. because i mean i was always known as the model of the family because i was so conscious about my weight i always had been because i come from a big family as well you know we're slightly overweight Mm. and so i always thought i can't i can't let myself get there Mm. and i think i think i don't know like i lost the plot i think for the first time in high school, I was getting 20 rand for tuck shop money. Mm. I was like, this is amazing. This and is I think I thing. lost it. And that's why I was eating cake, <laughs> chocolate, Any, I was everything. anything I everybody. could. Everybody. Everybody, because <laughs> we could, <laughs> this is stuff we couldn't eat often enough. Yeah. Like, I, I put on like a lot of weight. And so, I, I yeah, I went through it. it like high school was a roller coaster weight twice for me. Like I'd go through periods of really starving myself. Like I think I had a severe body dysmorphia mm. that's taken me so long. I mean, years after to really overcome because I, I've, I like swore to myself, I'd never get fat. Mm. I'd have my cousin who'd always taunt me and tell me she I was so fat. Mm. And that used to traumatize that me because I never wanted to hear that I'm fat mm. and that really hurt me. And because all the white people were always like so ironing board like, yeah. you know, no bum, no yeah. hips, barely very boobs, boyish, very yeah. boyish. Fi- and y- we always thought that's what you're supposed to look like. That's the standard of beauty. Mm. Skinny was the b- new beauty. Mm. Like in black culture, it's okay for someone to call you fat and, yeah. you know, because you're happy and mm-hmm. you look good. Mm. And it's like, it was so offensive mm. to us now, like, you know, to me and, and some of my peers, because mm. nobody, when somebody tells you you're so skinny, it's like such a huge compliment. Yeah. Thank you. Meanwhile, really? you yeah. have a serious eating disorder. Yeah. <laughs> you are so mentally ill. <laughs> you it's actually true. need help. <laughs> so, sure. like, that's still a, cons- like a, a, um, a consistent struggle of mine, mm. um, because it's like in my mind, I really can't let myself gain too much weight where somebody like calls me fat because mm. i think it's so it's it, it's gonna take a while for us to unlearn these things because mm. it's almost like they've become our culture and they became who we are and how we thought so I fo- like skin was my face was not even a problem f- you know for a while it was just my body and my back mm. Mm. that's so interesting so acne literally just became a problem for me in my 20s and it was a shock for me when i started to break out little by little it started on my forehead (coughs) i'd have like lesions like Mm. in this region and around my face and my mom was shocked because she was like why are you breaking out and she was accusing me of eating sweets and not e- not having um not keeping a consistent and good diet and i was like mom i'm not eating sweets i was like i was like fighting with her and i was i was just i just couldn't understand because my mom i think she also put a lot of pressure on me because it was like 
I think my younger sister is way prettier than me. Uh, and, and, and literally in my mind, it's because she had the fairer features. Mm. See, she had the like, you know, pointy nose, mm. she had the fair eyes and she had the light skin. And naturally, she was such a cute child. Like, if you go around my house and you just see cute pictures of my sister, and I don't know what happened to me. I, like, something <laughs> took a turn in my childhood. <laughs> I was such a weird looking child. <laughs> and so, like, you know, my mom would always, like, you know, pinch my nose and say, you know, just don't go to bed without doing this. Just oh, make sure. For real. For real. Sorry, mom. <laughs> love you. I still love, love you, you so much. <laughs> But I don't blame her because, Mm -hmm. I mean, being white, Mm -hmm. being in those days and the days where she grew up and being in the apartheid government, I mean, they went through the worst. Mm -hmm. Like, if you were light-skinned, okay, maybe you're colored. But now we have to do the pencil test to Mm -hmm. qualify you (laughs) as either a black or a colored person. Mm -hmm. So it was really serious. So I think for a lot of people, like, you know, even in the townships, like, the lighter you are, the more beautiful you are. Yeah, that's very true. And... I hated that. I hated that. I hated being put on a pedestal and nobody knew what I was suffering from Mm -hmm. internally. I had like severe insecurities Mm -hmm. body wise. I had like a severe body disorder, like Mm -hmm. dysmorphic disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, I just really saw the worst in my skin, Mm -hmm. in my body, my shape, my height, everything. Mm -hmm. There was always just something wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think I just had, I really just had a really stressed time in my teenage years and it was a build up it was a build up of you know there was a build up of that stress and i think a lot of it had to do with the fear of being rejected mm. like you said mm. um so like my father when my father left the family when we were very young, very young i didn't realize how that impacted me mm. how much that you know like influenced me psychologically and like really made me feel like okay maybe we're not good enough to you know for him to stick around and mm-hmm. um I did feel rejected, mm. you know, and I, I, psych- I think it was more subconsciously that I that that impacted me. So I think I carried myself like I just didn't belong anywhere, and like I, like I needed to to change myself in, t- in order to fit in yeah. in different mm-hmm. spaces and with different people, and and um, maybe I was not dark enough, maybe I was not thin enough, maybe mm. I was not tall enough, maybe I was not you know, white enough. Um, so I think I had a really, really stressful uh, teenagehood, childhood. And that's what made you then start to break out? I believe yeah. so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was, I was saying during the break that um, I read recently, because we, so, we think that acne, <coughs> the causes of acne and skin disorders is mostly either, you know, her- hereditary, mm-hmm. the food we eat, or just the stage like being a teenage hormone hormone changes Mm -hmm. but recent uh, more recent medical research has shown that it also stems from a fear of um, 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 from a a root of anxiety and fear fear of rejection um, fear of not fitting in and um, it's it's really insane and how your mental health has a lot to do with how sick you get mm-hmm. as well in your body. Mm-hmm. Um, mental health and not just what you put in your mouth and what you, uh, and h- uh, yeah, and what you drink and what you don't eat and what you do eat, um, you know, impacts on your health. It's not just that. That's all important, but it all it all starts with your psych- with your psyche, how you mm-hmm. view yourself. Like if a, a person that loves their body wants to eat right, they want to feed their, their body the right things, and it really starts from being conscious and aware mm-hmm. of yourself and, and, and loving yourself and accepting yourself first, mm-hmm. you know, and letting go of that fear of not being accepted, letting go of that fear of not mm-hmm. being loved, of not being, you know, taken in and appreciated and it's, it's got to start on the inside and I think that's where I lost the plot and I and I, when I got to Joburg I think I didn't fit in even more because I went to a fashion school and a lot of the kids that went there were rich most of them had cars um, they came from you know they, their parents gave them everything they had the latest fashion they had the latest they were wearing the, br- the brands you know they they just had it going on and in that school, if you didn't have, you literally was it set you back. Um, 
I mean, it meant sometimes you didn't get your projects done or it, your projects didn't look as great and you didn't get as, you know, a great mark because, I mean, you can't afford to do mm -hmm. all of that. You mm -hmm. can't afford to drive to this place and get that. You can't afford to buy this fabric and achieve that. And that really took a toll and I <laughs> gained way more weight, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, because I was starting to eat junk. I was living on my own. You know, I was like, I just don't really have time to cook. I don't want to do it. And uh, for the first time in my life, I had some severe breakouts on my face. Okay. I had bad discoloration because I was light skinned. Um, but it was coming out in legions. Like if I was trying to cure this one, mm. another one would pop out, mm. pop out in its place. And mm. it just, it was like a never ending thing. And that like killed my self esteem even more mm. because I was like, how do people even look at my face? Mm. Like I don't even know how um how I'm around these people, how I'm, I'm carrying on and, mm -hmm. and how I'm able to to look at somebody in the eye because sometimes because then you just don't want people to look at you and mm -hmm. you shy away, you want to go sit in the corner and just like not have anybody like really look at you or really engage with you. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was a really, really tricky time and <laughs> I couldn't afford the fa expensive face products because okay. you know, I remember I was like, okay, maybe I should start using uh, having like a face regimen because I mean I never, I never, I never cared. Like I'd never like wash my face twice a day. Yeah. It was I just like wash it, you know, in the morning and that's it. Mm -hmm. I'm done for the day and mm -hmm. I can just go straight to bed. But now it was like, oh my gosh, maybe okay, I need to use specific face mm -hmm. products and mm -hmm. let me try Clean and Clear. Let me try, um, uh, Garnier. Mm -hmm. Let me try Oxy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I never got to try Oxy. Mm -hmm. But I was, I wanted to try everything. I mean, I tried as much as I could. I mean, I got, I got advice from different people. And of course, I couldn't afford to mm -hmm. go to a dermatologist and, and ask a doctor. I was like, maybe if I go on contraceptives, because they seem to work for everybody yeah, else. Yeah. You know, meanwhile, I had a severe chemical imbalance <laughs> that was probably causing me to, to, for my body and my cells to break down. Yeah. So in this book, that I that um, this this doctor <coughs> explains how when you um, when you think negatively, certain chemicals get released into your body, and uh, and of course we pick up um, bacteria and things you know during the day because of the environment people mm -hmm. we come into contact with and all of that, but it's all fine and well. You you can't even get sick unless your immune system is compromised, and when those harmful chemicals from your thought life and from your brain waves get released into your body, they weaken your body cells and your defense, um, mm. your defense, your body's defense and immune system. And those infections are able to permeate and go into those cells and corrupt the, your body and your system. And um, I believe what causes inflammation in our body when we get injured and everything is a, is a hormone or a chemical called histamine, mm. which, causes inf which causes the inflammation and the redness because the blood seeps through the vessels and kind of like it thins, it thins and it causes the redness. And so you suffer. Mm. So it's all coming from like a negative thought life, um, translating into harmful chemicals being released in our bodies and ultimately our bodies reacting negatively our bodies kind of like attack itself attack the itself you know um because of the way we because of the way we we, we view ourselves and the way we think and the way we what we meditate on and um i didn't realize that that's what i was doing and it and i mean years later i think this carried on from like 2012, sorry, 2010, I think that's when the acne really started to flare up, um, up until maybe 2015. And that's when I was starting at the job I'm working at right now, and uh, I was integrated into the intern um, uh, program. program. And my skin and the discoloration of my skin was just so far gone. I just like, you know, I hadn't given up though. I was gonna try everything. I tried tea tree oil. I tried every like natural um, remedies. Yeah. You know, I started going back to gym. I was like, okay, they say if you sweat it out, yeah. it clears your skin. 
I was wearing makeup every day. I was like, I can't. I can't have people mm. look at me like this. Makeup is my new friend. This is how people are going to actually, like, see me. They need to always see me looking sharp and normal, like, mm. you know, other other kids. Mm. Um, I think it was later on in that year when I was like, how long am I going to keep this going? Will I ever recover from acne? Must mm. I just give up and not care and just like wear makeup every day and cover my pain Mm. (laughs) or can I actually just accept that my skin won't clear unless I actually stop putting on a facade and just stop putting on a mask and stop clogging my pores Mm -hmm. with foundation and and all these things I was like okay it's fine I'll st- I'll, I'm just going to stop doing all of this. I'm going to stop putting my skin through so much. I mean, in this whole period, I even got warts. Like, they were so gross. Mm. And they ca- when, they, when they came out, they came out like, like the pimples. Mm. And they were literally on my neck area. They were so gross. They looked pussy. They looked like pussy mm. pimples. The, the things I used to put my skin through, like, I bought this wart magic thing. But it did work a charm. I won't lie. <laughs> Like, there's nothing. (laughs) I have no more warts. (laughs) I burnt, I literally burnt my skin off. Mm. It was awful. I was, I had like plasters and pigmentation and Mm. fresh acne, Mm. uh, you know, outbreak, breakouts. It was just like an awful time. Like, I went through a really weird patch and Mm. being overweight for a bit and was a very very low mm. time um i must have been about 20 19 19 and 20 21 but i decided 2015 that you know enough is enough mm. um i'm gonna actually start loving myself mm. i'm gonna start accepting myself mm. i'm gonna wear my acne out it's fine it's okay if that's what it, if that's what it's gonna take for my skin to clear. It's fine. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll 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 love myself. I'll be myself. Mm. Um, people can see me for who I am. Mm. I mean, in all of that, that's when I even started growing my natural hair because I was like, it is what it is, man. Mm. I just can't afford also to keep up with the whites, mm. <laughs> who are the Joneses, who are the <laughs> official Joneses. Mm. I can't afford it. I just don't have the money for it. Mm. And it doesn't make sense to me why I should spend so much mm. trying to conform when I'm an individual, when I'm different, when I'm made perfect for my destiny. Mm. Everything about me is unique for a reason. Mm. It's okay. Mm. So psychologically, I started to get myself right. It's okay not to cover up. It's okay. What are you hiding? I still haven't overcome that from <laughs> my back. And I think I just got used to being comfortable and just not wearing things that are strappy. And it's okay sometimes for me to actually walk around wearing something, showing my back a bit. And, and like I'm overcoming it just little by little. But I think f- the first breakthrough for the problems I had was to understand, first of all, you can overcome. Mm. So many people have gone through it and so many people have come out of it. And you might not find one specific product, but eventually it will end. Mm-hmm. This does not go on forever. Mm-hmm. And you can just carry on with your life and, and make goals and pursue life and live it and love it. And it's okay. Whoever wants to be around you will be around you and they'll appreciate and love you. And mm-hmm. whoever's not meant to be around you doesn't need to be around you. It, it's, it's okay. I think I, I was just like you, Bianca. At some point I was like, Actually, I'm way too tired. I'm not even yeah, trying to no. fit in. <laughs> I am okay. so tired. Yeah. I'm really, I'm okay. Yeah. I, I, I enjoy my company. I enjoy, my, I enjoy myself. I enjoy learning and reading and you mm-hmm. know, stuff on the internet. Mm-hmm. And, and just doing research about natural remedies and natural um, uh, you know, solutions mm. and... and and I just wanted to be natural. I just wanted to be a child of the earth for a while. Mm-hmm. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> so when you come back from the break, um, I'd like Bianca to delve deep into her um, journey with acne. So see you guys soon. Mm-hmm. 
awesome. Like I, I speak about the topic of acne because I'm struggling with it currently. And it only, it only came like around 2015, around, but it became very worse, I think around late last year and now. Now it's like, it's gone out of control. So it's a very, it's a conversation that's, you know, one of the conversations that are very close to my heart because um, I don't like, I, I still am not, you know, secure enough to leave the house without makeup. I have to have makeup on before I leave. So kudos to you for getting to that place. And girls, like, I think maybe, you know, work your way to getting there as well to a place where you can feel comfortable enough and secure enough to like leave the house, you know. I am not there yet. It's still like a, you know, a journey for me. Yeah. Um, and I felt like it was important for us to speak about this topic yeah. and how you felt in those moments when you were, mm-hmm. you know, having acne. It's so mm-hmm. important for the girls to know that because we in society, and I was talking about this with Mamelo in the previous show, that we romanticize so many things. And I think we romanticize the idea of having beautiful skin. Yeah. And, you know, that is the bar of being beautiful yeah. and the epitome of, you know, being an attractive woman. And mm-hmm. those were the things that I was you know questioning is that why is this flare-up of acne making me think twice about who I am as a person you know and why is it making me feel less attractive you know um yeah so Bianca if you can take us through like your journey with Mm. acne and you know how did it make you feel and you know how did you work through that well um I think if I can remember correctly the acne started um in grade seven mm. and like the day that I realized was when we had to take get our school pictures taken mm. <laughs> and um <laughs> I remember you told me about this though yeah I had to tie my hair back and like it was just all over here but like so many like mm. little dots like little ants on my face and mm. I was like oh my gosh mm. like is this real and like I mean like you're saying about like you know it's just like society and it's it's all those pressures but it's it's natural as well and you know with everything else i was dealing with now i was like oh my gosh now my skin's bad as well it's like geez like can i just have a break (laughs) so i remember you know when that happened i was just like shucks like this is so i just felt really embarrassed and so uncomfortable Mm. and but you know like i smiled through it like Mm. i was faking it hard like I'm actually gonna go look for that picture now (laughs) like when I will when I get home but um I just it's it's just sad that like you know I had to fake it Mm. but I really did feel like crying on the inside and um from that time it just got worse and worse and worse and worse it wasn't all over my face it was just on my forehead Mm. but it was like hectic Mm. like there was no covering that up Mm. you know so um my hair was always in always in braids so I'd like take my fringe and like clip it this way to sort of like cover it but you can see it's like girl no that's (laughs) looking weird like it's not flowing come on come on you know so it was like a lot of that stuff a lot of hiding um and I also did like I wore a little bit of makeup to school even though we obviously weren't allowed to but I would have to just like put some foundation over Mm. because it was like white and It was just really bad. And then when I try and pop them, then it's like they go black because of the scarring. It's like, shucks. Now I also have to cover that up. So it just became a mess. Mm. And um, it was pretty traumatizing. Um, In grade nine, I got to the point where now everyone else at school was going on Rakuten. Mm. And I was like, I also need to go on Rakuten, mom. Like, make a plan, you know. But it's like also so much pressure for your parents. Mm. But... And gosh, I love my, my parents so much, really, because I know I also put, thre- put them through a lot because of my insecurities and like, you know, trying trying to get them to sort of also keep up with these these like white children's parents yeah. as well who are able to pay for Rakuta. Yeah. And I mean, it's nothing, you know what I mean? But I did, I, I think I did pressure them to like <laughs> put me on Rakuta because I was desperate. I was like, yeah. the this acne has to go. Yeah. Like, you know, and I was on Rakuta and... I don't know if you guys have ever been on it but it's I like have, yeah. the first two weeks is just insane yeah. and that's for the first time that's where it came everywhere my lips were so dry they were cracking like bleeding it was really really bad mm-hmm. and so that's what they said cool two weeks of that it gets worse before it gets better and it didn't really get like better better like everyone else's results mm-hmm. And that also comes down to, I mean, hormones and stuff mm-hmm. that you're speaking about and everyone's different, you mm-hmm. know? So I was like, shucks, like, this is so frustrating. Mm-hmm. You know, my parents have spent all this money and now I still have these bumps on my face. 
And I think I just reached a point where I sort of just let it go. Um, but it was difficult because my everyone in my family has great skin. Like, mm. everyone's skin is, like, clear. Like, mm. clear as day. And I'm just like, shucks, okay? Like, what's going on with me? Like, why... You know, why am I also not like that? So even though in the back of my mind, I was trying to tell myself, like, no, like, it's nothing, it's fine, I will pass, like, just eat this, exercise, drink water, nothing was really working. It was still very um, pressurizing because you'll go to, like, family lunch and there's everyone, like, not re- not wearing makeup and their skin is glowing oh, and it's like, great, I'm just yeah. like, oh, so wanna, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, and that's also when I went through a time of like wearing a lot of makeup and yeah. my dad hated it mm. but I was like he didn't understand like <laughs> what I was saying you know he was kind of like no but you're beautiful and yeah. you d- he, I like now when I look back I'm like shame he was just trying to uplift mm-hmm. me and and just make me feel confident but really it was so tough mm-hmm. and we would fight a lot about it because he's like no I'm, I'm like banning you from using this makeup and you would like chuck it out and i'll go and steal my mom's and it was just like this whole thing like it just felt like this never ending like how am i gonna it was so stressful and i think just that stress and my cortisol levels going up was what was making it flare up and all these just all these other stresses of being a teenager Mm. um so okay we got i mean i got to a point where i was just like well this is it like i don't know what i'm gonna do Mm -hmm. and um Another thing is I also wasn't eating well. Mm. Like, I was a child and I was also going through, like, I can eat what I could have eaten, whatever I wanted to eat, and nothing was going to happen. I wasn't going to gain weight. I wasn't going to, you know what I mean? Like, I wasn't going to feel tired and mm. everything was fine. Metabolism was, like, peaking. Everything was good. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't really, like, take the time and effort to maybe try and change my diet and whatever else. Um, but when I, when I left school, like, around 19, 20, I think that's when like around that age i think that's when things started changing i don't know what happened but my skin just calmed down completely Mm. um but also at the same time i started looking after my skin more i started actually following like a skin regime like Mm. you were saying like you know washing my skin twice a day and like moisturizing like trying to eat well because like when i left school like the weight gain was also starting to happen like Mm. It wasn't drastic, but there was, like, things that I couldn't just eat anymore and, yeah. like, be fine, you know, or, like, not work out or do anything or be active for a certain amount of time. Like, shucks, like, it's going <laughs> on, you know? Like, I, I could be, like, do nothing and I'm fine. And it was a lot of those changes as well. So I think, for me, what happened is just moving out of that stressful period of, like, mm. high school and, like, you know, just being able to be on my own and sort of break free and figure life out, I think when that stress was taken out, it helped me, you know, and helped my skin. And then also just actually eating well. Like, I started enjoying healthy food, which I never, ever did. Like, I could finish a large pizza from Debonair's, like, on my own, and I'm still hungry. Like, there was still space for more, like, when I was young, you know? Like, and I got to a point where that wasn't, like, exciting for me. Like, now even, I'm like, Meh. like, I love, I do love pizza, but, like, the like how I feel and how my skin feels and how my body feels when I eat well it's just so much more worth it for me Mm. like don't get me wrong like I love I love like chicken chicken and all that Mm. stuff I love it but just like if I eat too much of that stuff my skin does start flaring up I feel tired I'm like groggy all the time like it just doesn't feel good Mm. so yeah the healthy eating helped drinking a lot of water as well helped Mm. um also sleeping more like I never used to sleep um, because you know staying up so late trying to do projects and all this stuff and like I played netball at the time as well and I was in grade 11 playing with a, a 21 year olds mm. and they're all in university and I had to play according to their schedule mm. so basically I was coming home at like midnight every night and still having to come back like study or do an assignment Shut and still wake up at six for like normal netball training at school. So it was a lot, you know, and I wasn't sleeping. So I think now like, you know, getting the eight hours in Mm. and also trying natural stuff as well. Like that's helping me so much. Like the turmeric and like avo and egg whites and coconut oil, coconut butter, all of that stuff. Um, Aloe vera, tea tree oil. It's really doing a lot for me. But I think it's important. Like it's it's a holistic thing. It's not just like, you know, skincare or eating right or sleep. It's everything all together, you know, like um, exercising, uh, like everything. Also mental state. It's like something that you need to practice 
every day until it just becomes instilled in you, you know, because it's not like sometimes I really don't feel like doing my whole nighttime routine. At n- I'm like, God, I'm so tired. But like, I'm just like, no, like, let me just do it. You know, it's part of the whole thing, you know, and then I'm going to sleep, wake up early. I can exercise, you know, all of those different things. So I think they all go hand in hand. And it's just something that the more you do, the easier it becomes. Yeah. Awesome. So obviously it's a Friday, so people are having the best time of their lives outside. So if you're having scream, if you're hearing screams, yeah. we're not killing anyone. <laughs> people are having a jaw. People are out there eating joy. Um, that's very very like great. If you can also help us with letting us know about your regime, um, what is it? Did you what did you start doing in terms of your face and your skin, and you know um, to make it bounce back into it being the way that it is? Because she's not wearing any makeup, guys, I mean, right now. Her skin is like. Slow Makeup. <laughs> uh, like mascara is the makeup she's talking about but there's no foundation no nothing she's just like silky smooth <laughs> glowing okay i am wearing a bit of blush i don't want everyone to be fooled yeah, but like, there's, no there's no foundation no concealer no concealer no, no nothing like i seriously divorced foundation when <laughs> i when you know i was like i'm not gonna cover up anything like like, I so agree with everything that B just said. Like, I think, Linda, even with you and your current struggle, I think just putting the right practices and the most wholesome practices into play right now is a great place to start. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mentally, mm-hmm. look at yourself and, and tell yourself, what are you most afraid of? Mm-hmm. You know, are you afraid of rejection? Is it people's opinion that affects you? Is it how people see you? Because I think the worst things that affect us the most are things that have nothing to do with us. Yeah. And, you know, we put on um, other people's perceptions as our realities. Mm-hmm. And we, put, we, uh, we, we add p- unnecessary pressure on how we view ourselves and how we feel we should be and perceive. And like you said, being a beautiful woman, what does that mean to you? Is it just about, is it about the superficial? Or is it about, you know, being a confident, brilliant black woman? Mm. What is it about, you know? And for me, it really started with me really, really, I d- like, you know, defining finding, that de- for defining that for myself mm. and, and knowing my identity and accepting that I am black and I'm so proud of it. And I think it's so beautiful to be black. doesn't matter what shade you come in or, mm. you know, what shape you come in, whether you have like a wide face, a fat nose, a flat one, a pointy one, like you're beautiful, you're black and you're beautiful and it's okay to be unique and to be yourself. Your journey is different and it's okay. Mm. <laughs> it's okay. So holistically, I know I never used to drink water in high school. Like I just, oh. I wasn't the healthiest of people, but I do realize now that I never got as unhealthy as I did post high school. And that's where, you know, I went through the most, skin-wise, weight-wise. But once I started gaining control, I was like, I, w- I want to eat right. I want to exercise. I want to try the good things. Let me see how that makes me feel. And so it comes with a lot of self-motivation. It comes with a lot of pushing yourself and, and, and setting goals for yourself and, and setting a standard really for yourself and not allowing anybody else to set that standard for you. And, and knowing who you want to be and how you want to treat yourself. And like I told myself when I was trying to lose weight, like, you know what, um, you might never be you know, a certain size, but you need to be the best shape that you can be. You need to be the best possible you. And be happy when you get there. Know that it, you can maintain it and know that you did it by yourself and know that you're beautiful when you do get there. I might never be a size 28, that's not my structure. If I'm a size 32, then I'm happy. I'm fine. I believe I'm beautiful, you know. Um, you know, like, if I think about my ancestors, you know, my Chinese people. Mm. You know, they built that way, not mm. <laughs> that way. <Yeah. laughs> you know, just embrace who you are. Embrace where you are. Go through it and know that somebody you, you can encourage somebody else. Um, your journey is not in vain. Mm-hmm. It's, it, you will come out on the other side victorious. Um yeah for me like for my skin i think um where did it start for you like what did you first into that you saw started working 
but if we can please um get into that like just yeah. just the idea of i just wanted to find out like where did it where did you see when you started doing this to your skin yeah. it started working and responding in a good way and what did you then carry on doing as a, reg- a regiment is that how you say it regiment, yeah. as a regiment carrying on um after that um see you guys in a couple of seconds Uh, welcome back. So just for, for those that are watching and they're just like, what is it that you started doing to your skin that you saw, um, you know, gave you the results and then you carried on doing and what then did you end up doing in terms of your regimen? Regimen. Regi- regi- regimen. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so once I got a stable job, I always felt like, okay, you know, let me just try a really good product. Yeah. Let me have a three-step um, regimen yeah. and let me be consistent yeah. and let me do it properly and, and and let me see if I can see a difference. Mm-hmm. So I think when I stopped wearing makeup and started a new job, I was like, okay, I'm going to buy myself Clinique products. Mm-hmm. You know, my mom was always recommended. I either try Olay or, you know, she's always like called the names. And I was like, okay, cool. Let me just try that and see if it makes a difference. And I'm not sure if that exactly started doing the trick but my skin started responding to consistency Mm. a consistent skin regimen um i also learned a few years later because you always think i can just scrub you know the 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 skin the dead skin off and get that ugly dirt Mm. and i that that i found aggravated the acne you know so over scrubbing and 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 you know putting your skin through hell that actually aggravates the acne so i found that being gentle with my skin as well and how i actually apply my my liquid um cleanser you know it made a difference so the more gentler and the more i treated my skin with love the you know it started responding slowly but surely but i wouldn't just i wasn't just using a three step um regimen of a specific product i was also trying to incorporate some natural products like tea tree oil like you know sometimes i just like use that to tone with Mm. you know just take a cotton pad and you know you know dampen it with some water and put a drop or two of tea tree oil and just like Mm. you know use it as a toner (laughs) on your skin and and that really helps with the inflammation Mm. helps open the pores and helps your skin to breathe and it's an antibacterial as well um I really went crazy with the natural stuff as well because eventually mm-hmm. I was like, oh, this is a little bit expensive. Yeah. Not everybody can afford this. Um, so I really started using stuff like uh, bentonite clay as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like that really treated me well. It's a little powder. It's, I don't even know how, how to describe the color <laughs> of the powder, um, but you can buy it even from Discam, from the Nature's Choice mm-hmm. uh, uh, range. Um, just mix it with water. It's known as a as a good detoxifier. Mm. Like I even use it to wash my hair because it's such a great cleanser and um, it helps you know with your pH balance as well. Mm. A little bit of um, apple cider vinegar. Mm. Drink that as well. Put a s- teaspoon in your water. It helps with detoxifying your body because a lot of the toxins in our bodies also like find their way as out of our skin and um, what you put in is what you you know you, you get out of your body so for me it's like if you can eat it sometimes it's great because you can also you you can also put it on your body you can use it safe to use like they always um i, I read somewhere if you can't pronounce it maybe don't really use it um maybe it's a bit dangerous for you because you know some medical people don't even know how to pronounce those big names that you know they put together in laboratories and mm. They test some on animals. Some of them they don't even test on humans, and you just don't even know if they're gonna. It's gonna work for you. Yeah. You just don't know if something is gonna work for you. It's just being consistent, putting good practices in, treating yourself well. Um, I f- for me, I feel like the more natural the products, the better. Mm. Um, even w- with what you eat, um, there's a herbalist that I like to follow, um, and he 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 encourages a. A vegetable-based diet. I'm not saying everybody must stop eating a plant-based diet. And uh, his reasoning for it made so much sense to me. I still eat meat, but I did cut out meat for a short while. And my body responded amazingly. Because his theory was that your body responds 
to food that has a chemical that it has a chemical affinity to what are our bodies made out of carbon we mostly carbon we are carbon based beings even our brains mm-hmm. they work you know via electrical currents you know it's copper and and you know s- signals our through our bodies how our body and our brain communicates communicates through electric currents mm-hmm. so your body really responds to what it's chemically affili- aff- um, what it has a chemical affinity to so you know eating green as much green and just as much green as possible try and eat natural it's um it's not a myth you know living a wholesome Mm -hmm. life and you know you know living a clean life is just so good you know and it it contributes towards everything you benefit weight wise skin wise hair wise if you want your hair to grow eat right drink water I mean, we our bodies are 70, 74% water. Yeah. Uh, think about these things. Like, if your body is, ca- is carbon-based, should you not be taking in more carbon-based food? Mm. If your body is 75% water, shouldn't you not be hydrating yourself with H2O? Mm. Your body just needs a replenishment of these good minerals and substances sometimes. And a lack thereof, your mm. body carries too much toxins, stress hormones it attacks itself mm. you have all these things going on you're so confused you're chemically imbalanced it's it's just not a good base to start from you just gotta start loving yourself also in things that you do it's sometimes easier said than done to say you know it's it's, it's easy to say i love myself but then the way you treat yourself and the way you carry on in your lifestyle doesn't indicate so yeah, it's also easier than said, uh, no, easier said than done yeah. to also say eat healthy because then it's difficult to maintain that because it's expensive. Like a lot of people cannot afford to eat healthy. You know, a lot of people. Yes, I'm coming there. Just to like, yeah, yeah it's, that. it becomes <laughs> difficult for like a lot of people. Yeah. Like a lot of people feel like if they're going to go to Kauai or if they're going to go buy lettuce or buy whatever, as opposed to quickly go get McDonald's, quickly go get this or get that, that could be, that is probably unhealthy, but yeah. could actually be qu- a quick fix for them, but in an affordable way, you know? Okay, so you said quick fix, right? All these quick fixes add up. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, like, there was one month, it's usually in December anyways, and I'm just like, yo, and you look at how much, like, I'll spend on fast food because it's like, I'm so hungry, but it's like, okay, there's a McDonald's, there's a KFC, there's a, and it's quick, and then you're satisfied, but your bank account suffers even more <laughs> at the end, and I'm like, shuck, you know, so what I, basically what I do to help me with that whole thing, because Yes, in some cases you can say eating healthy is expensive, but it's also like uh, where are you going to eat? You know, like you mentioned Kauai. Mm. If you're to have Kauai for breakfast, lunch and dinner, it's going to be expensive. But if you're going to have a smoothie here and there, like it's fine. So what I do is I buy my stuff in bulk, um, like grains and... Well, okay, first of all, this is like generic advice because... um, Some people eat for their blood type. Mm. Some people are eating a certain way because they're first trying to lose some fat. Mm. Some people are trying to gain muscle. So, like, everyone's diet is different. Mm. So, what I would suggest is just doing a lot of research. Well, first figuring out what are you trying to achieve. Mm. Are you trying to get better skin? Are you trying to feel less fatigued? Are you trying to lose weight? You're trying to, you know, first figure that out. And then, if you can, go and see a nutritionist. Mm. Um, I went to one actually. Yeah, week. if you can, if you can afford it, yeah. that's yeah. the best thing to do. Mm. And they'll help you. They'll either help you eat for your blood type or whatever. They'll mm. they'll help you with that stuff. If you can't, just research, mm. you know. And like you're saying about following people, I mean, I follow a lot of people on Instagram, like overseas, especially in Australia. Mm. And um, they give so many tips on just like how to eat um well but that's not going to be too expensive so i buy a lot of my things my diet um is a lot of um healthy carbs so it will be brown rice wild rice um yeah sweet potatoes um low gi bread all of that stuff you know eating carbs guys you can eat carbs i mean that's a story that can go on forever where people feel like oh no 
but it's carb. No, you can eat carbs. You just need to know what type of carbs you can eat or like what should be moderated. You know, there's carbs in apples. So are you saying that you don't eat fruits? You know what I mean? Um, so it's also just like educating yourself in those departments. So I buy in bulk, I buy my grains in bulk. And then what I'll do is I'll buy my greens weekly. So, you know, I'll get lettuce because you can't do that in bulk. It's going to go off. Yeah. Um, lettuce, fruits, all of that. Um, it is also like season dependent, like fruits and stuff. Like right now, there's no berries anywhere. And personally, like I'm dying because yeah, I love like my um, smoothie smoothie bowls and all of that. But it's now I'm sort of figuring out how to make more like green juices and uh, smoothies with vegetables in it that that still taste good as well. But my point is like if you plan ahead. Um, and it's something that I'm learning a lot with adulting. Oh my gosh, guys. Sometimes I'm like, I just want to be a child again. Like, yeah. I'm so over this. But like, yeah. things will, like healthy food will seem expensive if yeah. you're going to a restaurant and ordering a massive chicken salad every day. It will, like it does add up and vice versa as well. If you're eating fast food all the time, it's great for that moment. But first of all, you're messing up your health. Second of all, you're messing up your bank account. Like, it's just this never-ending cycle. So my advice would really be to um, plan ahead. Well, first figure out what you're trying to achieve, then plan ahead and sort of shop accordingly. Mm -hmm. And then also, you also need to have a bit of um, discipline. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something I've had to really instill. Yeah, Yeah, because I love food. Anyone that knows me knows, like, I really love food. And I've had to instill, like, okay, moderation, Mm -hmm portion control like all of that stuff as well like if i'm eating massive portions of course the food's going to go quickly and i'm going to have to replace it even faster Mm -hmm. so it's just like um planning things out like i do try and i don't meal prep or anything like that it's too much for me i've tried it doesn't work but i do sort of give myself like a flexible menu for the week where i'll um what i say is like i try to eat the colors of the rainbow Mm -hmm. So the more colorful um, my plate is, the more nutrients I'm getting, all of those different things. But I also am realistic and I will give myself time to like go out for dinner with a friend. And I also like budget accordingly. You know, this is like a whole like budget (laughs) chat now. But really, like it just goes back to the whole thing of like healthy food is expensive. For me, it isn't. Mm -hmm. But that's because like I've learned how to budget all those different things, Mm -hmm. eat accordingly, you know, and it it does take a lot of discipline. I mean, it's not easy, but... And consistency. And consistency. Yeah, like consistency. It really, really does. But for me, like, when my body starts reacting well, like, mm. I have irritable bowel, bowel syndrome. Sorry, guys. Like, mm. I had to share that. But really, like, probiotics eating are probiotics. So yeah. And my nutritionist actually put me on probiotics. Awesome. And, and so like, yeah. apple cider vinegar. It's that's, yes. Yeah. You know, if you can't obviously afford to buy over the counter, yeah. you know, um, those things are just it's really really important like because when you start feeling those results of like okay my body feels better my tummy's not as sore I'm not as tired like I have more energy like because I we, people talk about it and it just seems like this oh yeah you're fatigued and I really really was feeling so run down I was getting sick all the time naturally I'm a sickly person there's always something wrong with me but when I wasn't eating well it was heightened like yeah. I was always like, I always had flu, like the other month I got flu twice in one month, you know, it's just like, and that's also because my diet was poor that month and I can be honest about that, you know, but once, once you start seeing those results, then you're able to still keep going and be like, no, yes, I'm going to rather choose to eat like this over eating like that, you know, the, like the, everything in the long run, it's, it's really so much more worth it, you know, than that quick fix that, you know, um, like that sugar like high that you get and then you crash immediately afterwards it's not sustainable at all you know and it's also comes down to what you were saying about wanting to um just like it's like self-love you know like if you look at my instagram i have a highlight reel called self-love and i put like like my green juices on the highlight reel and it's like if you'll only understand that if you're also going through that thing of like, you'll understand why that's self-love because it's it's looking after mm. yourself, mm. which is self-love, you know? So it also starts there mentally. Mm. Where, like, where are you trying to get to? What are you trying to achieve? Yeah. You know, mm. it's not only about, oh, I'm trying to lose weight and be scared. Like, no, it's not about that. For me, it's the holistic thing that I was speaking about earlier. Mm, that's very good. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I moved to town like a year ago and... Um, 
there's the markets and there's and even back home there's always the the street markets where they sell the fresh vegetables and you know people grow stuff in their gardens you know and yeah. they they go to town and they sell them and those are the cheapest you know vegetables and the mm. freshest you'll find you know, i mean i was i was never too proud to go to the streets i mean a bag of carrots maybe at a supermarket is like 12 rand on the street, it's six rand. Mm-hmm. So he's spending half the money, mm-hmm. and you're eating just as healthy, and you're getting all the vegetables mm-hmm. and all the fruits that you'll possibly get for way more mm-hmm. at a supermarket. The mall, I mean, they've got rent to pay. Mm-hmm. So I don't think there's no options for you mm-hmm. if you want to try and eat healthier. Mm-hmm. It's about the discipline, of course, mm-hmm. as well. And and f- I also found for myself that you know it's I have to try and work on a on a menu mm-hmm. on a weekly basis, and because I mean. Just the thought of meal prepping traumatized me. It's I was like, tiring. I can't do it. Yeah, <laughs> it is. I, I, like, I just, it's not for me. Mm. You know, for those that are way more disciplined and want to try and do that, by all means, yeah. find what works for you. I mm. so agree mm. with what B said. Mm. Find what works for you and just implement that in your life and stick to it and be consistent. Mm-hmm. And that's the only way you're really going to start to see a change. And, uh, and also, you know what? Even if maybe eating badly, maybe cheaper for some people, it's so expensive to be sick because of what you you put exactly. in your mouth. I mean, people yeah. are dying from diseases because of what they eat. Yeah. You know, I mean, more people are dying from cancer than they are dying from other viruses and diseases. Mm-hmm. It's so expensive to eat badly as well. It's re- it's not so okay. True. So sometimes you just want to take a little bit extra care for yourself and just pay a little bit more mm-hmm. just to keep a healthy, consistent lifestyle. Mm-hmm. I think first things first, um, you guys need to visit a nutritionalist because nutrition nutritionist. <laughs> things are bad with my English today, guys. How it is. You need How to visit is. a nutritionist. <laughs> Nutrish- nutritionist. Nutritionist. <laughs> That's who you need to visit. I visited one. Not this week. I visited one, I think, about two weeks ago. So, so helpful already. I could feel my skin clearing. I did the blood tests and he told me that there was a bit of inconsistency with my liver, with my bowel movements. And he said the reason why my liver was reacting is because my bowel movements were inconsistent. So then he put me on a probiotic and on natural remedies, which then helped so much with my skin. It's cleared out more than you can imagine. Um Yes, and it, and it really helps. It's it's a great starting base as well. I loved what Bianca said in terms of having to find the purpose behind of why you what do you want to accomplish in terms of your body. So do you want to look at great skin or do you want to look into getting you know a better physique, uh, feeling better, waking up better? So I think that drawing the line and knowing specifically, being very specific mm-hmm. with knowing and identifying what do you want to fix, what problem do you want to fix. Visit a nutritionist with that problem and. You you will know the starting base as to how to then carry on with it, what to eat. He will give you what to eat. Your body needs more of this. It needs less of this. There's too much protein, maybe less in your protein. So he'll be able to direct you better in terms of that. So guys, I just want to say thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your hearts. Thank you so much for speaking so much uh, wisdom and knowledge and especially from your journeys and being very candid about that. Um, I feel like we're not having enough of these kinds of conversations and I loved that you were able to spark some sort of you know, um, something for another person to want to look more into knowing how to treat themselves better and knowing that it's okay um, to go through the journey. It's okay to sometimes not be okay. It's okay that you are dealing with so many things of mental health, you know, and and, and dealing with so many things of, you know, social ideas, you know. um, I loved that you guys were able to touch on those kinds of topics as well. Um, yes, so um, I just want to wrap it up by saying the reason why we're wearing black is because we are standing in remembrance of Mama Winnie Mandela. Uh, to remind you again, Mama, as you are resting in strength, you didn't die, you multiplied. Mm. And we are here because of you. Um, our ability to be able to speak, um, our ability, I know you spoke about like, you know, as a black woman, you felt stifled and you felt like you didn't have a voice. You felt like you Mm -hmm. couldn't question, you couldn't say anything. And mama, you know, fought for that, fought for black woman to be a young black woman, to be able to question. I also never knew how to question a person. I never even thought that, that,
that is a thing that you that could you do. do yeah. And like for the longest time when I did question, I would feel so bad. Like yeah. I would feel like I've done something yeah. so bad. And mm. you know, she fought for us to feel comfortable in questioning. Mm. She fought for us to feel comfortable in standing up for what we believe is right and is true and what we're passionate about as women. So Thank you for that, Mama Winnie. As you're resting in strength, we love you and you will forever be missed. Um, and we hope that we make you proud. Um, are there any, do we have time for any last words? Abuti Clive? Yeah. Abuti Clive, please also come in front of the camera so people can see that you're wearing black on black. Black on black. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that the camera can handle itself there. <laughs> So, guys, here is Clive, the guy that is always behind the camera out yeah, there in the uh, streets. Yeah. Here he is. <laughs> Finally, you can see the face to the name. <laughs> Are we able to do any last words um, before we go? So, do you have anything that you'd like to say to the younger you, to the you that was, you know, going through your phases with skin uh, and having to come to a woman with so much rich knowledge about mm. self-love, health, and you know, healthy skin and, mm. and just who you are as a model as well. Because Bianca is a great model. Also, Stop very, very it, well, very, very amazing. Um, Thank so you. if you can just double into saying that and also end off with your handles where okay, people can cool. find you. Okay, so to anyone listening who this may resonate with, um, I think it's just really important to not be afraid to speak about things like mental health. Mm. Like, it is happening slowly where we're we the conversation is there mm. more but it's still not there enough mm. and um 100 yeah. percent. i just feel like 100%. there's nothing to be ashamed about mm. like i'm an open book mm. you know like in some ways i'm i can seem closed off mm. but trust me if we like on the same page mm. with a topic like I, like i don't i'm not i don't find it like weak um sharing my struggles mm. or like bad things that i've been through mm. because i'm always like i always wish that there was someone that was open and talking about these things when i felt alone when i mm. felt weird when i mm. felt ugly when i was crying you know like you can speak to your parents about these things but they don't i mean they're your parents mm. they have to be like it's gonna be okay There's they something about a young yeah. woman talking about it because so yeah awesome. someone that yeah there was no one I could relate to and be mm. like shucks like wow like thank you so much you've just given me the, like that push that I needed mm. to go on and to feel like there is hope and to be like oh okay this is normal and for people to know that it's an ongoing struggle like yeah. so many people it's like we've um, said in society there is a bar that you need to reach and at the end of that bar there will no longer yeah. be struggle yeah. but to recognize that you are every single day making a yeah. conscious decision yeah mm. so Basically, that's it. I mean, I've shared everything else about, you know, skin, skin tone, skin health, all of that. But for me, the biggest thing and like what I've also realized coming to the end of this conversation is the mental health part of everything. Because, 100%. I mean, it's something that I struggle with. Like, I can be honest about that. It is something that I struggle with. Mm. And it's something that every day I have to be, I have to wake up, look at myself and mm. be like, you can do this. Like, you've got this day. Like, just don't compare yourself to other people I'm like with you, girl, you know it's you have to keep motivating yourself Every and day. you know like you're saying about getting like, we set this bar and then mm. we reach the bar and we think that everything's going to be okay mm. afterwards or it's it's just something that you have to keep doing because mm. it's ongoing mm. so to yeah to anyone listening who may be going through something or who feels alone like you're not alone you know and um if you do want to follow me on Instagram, I'm, I always reply to everyone and I'm open to those things. Um, my Oh, yeah, I have to say my handle. My yes. handle is <laughs> my name and surname at Bianca Kuyabe. And um, if there's anything that you want to talk about or anything that's, that you're feeling insecure about or if you're feeling alone or if you just need a bit of love, like, really, I'm there and I mean that. Um I the main reason that I say that is because really I wish that I had someone to help me get through you know I think I just I think like I get my strength I feel from my mom she's extremely mm. extremely strong what an amazing woman so strong and um I feel like if I didn't have that strength like I don't know if I would be here today because I didn't have anyone to help me through this mm. I don't know how I got to this point where I, I can like speak about these things openly and like you know have a conversation about it but um it's just important to have 
people like a support system as well and if i can be a virtual support system like then i will be you know <laughs> um but yeah i i just feel like it's a cliche but like you can achieve whatever you want like if you set your mind to something really you can you can get there you just need to block out like any negative and just like bad things that because people are always going to say bad yeah. things you have to just always. block it out mm. it's just a part of life it mm. is what it is not everyone's going to support you or like agree with you or even understand you and i'm okay with that i used to be so like wow like why doesn't this person like mm. me like yeah. I, mean, I didn't do anything to them but it's just life mm. you're not going to like be on common grounds with everyone 100%. so you know stay in your own lane and like focus on your own journey and your own growth mm. and you will get there yeah. And if there's no lane that you can recognize with, create your own lane. Exactly. And run it. Exactly. Mm. Um. Yeah, Bianca, that was that was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, for me, I think what I want to say to the ladies, I'm, I think just first and foremost, connect with yourself. Um, connect with your own destiny. Connect with your own purpose. You're unique. No one is like you. No one is made for your path. No one is made for your purpose. So you got to have conversations with yourself and, and come to understand why you are and what you want to achieve in this lifetime and inform your own uh, bars. Create your own bars. Create your own lane. Yes. Don't let anybody else tell you what that's supposed to be for you. And like I said, because you are your own person, you are unique, you have your own purpose, you have your own destiny. And how you get there, it's not going to be like anybody else. Um, I'm really in the recent years I haven't been huge on social media because of of how you know the bars on social media were just just like not realistic for me I'm like I can't afford to live that life and it's okay um I really just do not subscribe um but I think you know the handles and the pages that have resonated with me are people that just do their own thing like I've always been like for weirdom like if you are so different and just yes, like and mm -hmm. no one is like you and people are looking at you like with side eyes i'm like i want to yes. walk with oh you <laughs> you are my person <laughs> so i think cool. create your own standards create your own norm and be comfortable with that like there came a time where i was like i don't want to look like everybody else because that's going to make me um compare myself to those people i don't want to subscribe to the latest trends because it's going to make me want to compare and see mm. Im, if i can afford to look as good as the sharpest person so do what makes you happy i mean f i think the thrifting trend really made my life because i was like i don't have to go to the brands yes. to look sharp i so love wearing my five run pants and i love people asking me where in the world did you get those and i love that i'm the only one who has them yes. so do your own thing walk your own walk be your own person you know create be your own love story and just like you said and i like it's okay to go through you know yeah. stuff life is a journey there's ups there's downs and we were saying before we started shooting and we we're having a conversation yeah. about how nothing in life comes easy you yeah. have to work at it mm -hmm. You know, there's mm. always going to be challenges. You can't run away from them. You just have to face them. And if it's your test, overcome. Mm. You can because those tests were, were made for you. Mm. Like a test in school, you made, they teach you, they groom you, they build up your confidence so that you can actually pass those tests. Like it can be done. Yeah. You are not, the, the test is not above you and you're not beneath your test. Mm. The, it's, you're made to soar. You're made to pass. Mm. So... Yeah. And where, peop where can people find you? So on my Instagram, my handle is at Sparshals, <laughs> spelled S-B-O-S-H-L-E-S. -S -S, and uh, my yeah. Facebook is Sibongile Mkyobo. Mkyobo spelled M-T-Y-O-B-O. Spongile is amazing. Her hair is like up to her bums. Can I just say, and that's her natural hair. 
<laughs> okay. And she does natural things for her hair as well. So if ever you want to buy anything natural, like a sheer butters and, and any creams and washes, the clay masks um, for her hair that she was speaking about, she actually, in fact, has a company of her own that, she, you know, she does that. So if you're ever in need of even knowing how to naturally take care of yourself, contact them both um, and they should be able to help you in that regard. Anyways, thank you so much for your time, guys. We really appreciate that you took some time to watch this conversation. It was such a pivotal one, I think. Um, and it's the last of our season. Um, and I think we've ended on such a great note um, in, in, in having this conversation. So, guys, see you the next time in the next season. And we hope that you've enjoyed conversations with my big sister. Um, and where you can find me is on Instagram. Um, my handle is the underscore letter L. Uh, or you can just type out the letter L and you can find me. And my name on Facebook is Linda Sifumba. Um, and on Inst on Twitter, it's also at the underscore letter L. So, yeah. So, I'll see you guys soon. Um, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. If you want to subscribe, subscribe. Um, yeah. And we'll see. Wherever you're seeing it, just subscribe there on that page. <laughs> you know. You might also see it on Cooler Box Production. Subscribe there, babes. Yes. If you're seeing it on there, yes. subscribe. Just subscribe <laughs> wherever you're seeing the show. Um, yeah. And enjoy the rest of of your life. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>